Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, and it's my pleasure to have Dr. Will Cole with us. Will is a leading functional medicine expert who consults people around the world via webcam and locally in Pittsburgh. He is a New York Times bestselling author and host of the popular podcast, The Art of Being Well. Will, it's so great to have you on the show. Thanks so much for having me. So let, let's start off with uh, how you ended up writing The Art of Being Well. By the way, I'm a co-author of The Art of SEO, so I, I love where you're going with your book title. <laughs> well, yeah, and actually, The Art of Being Well is my podcast. It's, it's not my book. So, oh, right. Yeah, it, uh, okay. Yeah. So what's the name of your book? Because it's, uh, it's not in your bio. Yeah, it's okay. So I've written a few books. I've, I've written, my first book was Ketotarian. Uh, my second book is The Inflammation Spectrum, and my newest book is Intuitive Fasting. But The Art of Being Well, it's my podcast, and it's just a major component of what I do in functional medicine. There's, a, there's this duality of, of health and wellness. There's the science and the art. And the art of wellness is something that it, it's you, you implementing the best of clinical nutrition and science and the data and implementing it into your life in something sustainable. And that's why I call it the, the art of being well, the podcast. But all this stuff is predicated on the fact that I just, uh, I, what I do is I consult patients 10, 11 hours a day. So you kind of boil that into the books and boil that into the podcast. I just love this stuff so much. Wow, that's a lot. How do you keep going? That, that's I, When I have back-to-back -back calls, for let's say five hours at a, at a time, it's exhausting. I just don't have anything left. So I don't know how you do it. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, I have to, I have to practice what I teach my patients, right? I mean, it's really putting my wellness first and having healthy boundaries. Even if I'm busy, I'm still can having, uh, have healthy boundaries and um, really carving out what I need to be the best that I can be for my patients because it is a sacred responsibility. I am holding space for people that are going through very heavy things, meaning they're struggling with autoimmune problems and chronic fatigue syndromes and chronic infections like mold toxic. I mean, really not walks in the park, like very heavy stuff. So me being the best version of myself and being on point and being sharp and being present for them is a uh, part of the job. I can't, I can't just phone it in. Uh, so, you know, this is a way of life for me. It's just a way of life. And it's, and, and that's what I try to teach my patients is to have this sort of intuitive awareness on what your body loves and what your body hates. And like, if you even notice, like where I'm consulting patients in here all day long. So I'll have like plants in here, essential oils going. I have, uh, uh, I'm eating clean foods. I'm taking my supplements. All the things that I'm telling my patients is to really make your life um, conducive to how you want to feel. And if something's out of alignment, it should go away. When, <laughs> you, you really need to have healthy boundaries. And I think a lot of people just settle for going about their day without really taking inventory of what actually is serving them and what's a saboteur, what's out of alignment with how you want to feel and the life you want to live. Right, right. And so how do you not take on everybody else's uh, problems and uh, kind of bad energies and so forth when you're working with so many different people? That stuff rubs off like energetically and, and it might sound a little woo-woo, but uh, I, mm. I believe it to be true. It, it, yeah, it is true. Uh, and, and people, especially people like myself, are more empathic too. You have to, that's part of the healthy boundaries part. It is, uh, we start our day off as a clinic. I mean, I, we, we're telehealth entirely. And we, we st I started one of the first functional medicine telehealth centers in the world over a decade ago. So I, this has like been my main focus for a long time, but we, most of my team is here in the telehealth center and the uh, here locally. And, um, we start our day off with prayer and meditation for our patients. Uh, but also for ourselves as a team. So it's really just grounding practices, staying consistent, and, but also making your life a meditation. So it's not just that sort of corporate, uh, like formal thing that we're doing as a team, but it's also, okay, what, do I, I, what am I doing in between visits? So I will do meditation in between consulting patients. I can't go like back to back because you are sort of accumulating that energy throughout the day. Um, and yes, that's, just carved into my schedule to be, again, the best I can be for the people that I'm serving. Mm. So how, how do you 
define yourself? Are you like a functional medicine guy? Are you a biohacker? Are you a, a spiritual guy? Like what, uh, what's, how, how would you introduce yourself to somebody you've never met before? I'm a functional medicine doctor. I'm a functional medicine practitioner. That's my main, that's how I would uh, describe myself. That's, uh, that's what I do. Um, yeah. So it, it all kind of stems from that, I guess, professionally, but yeah, it's, but mm -hmm. spiritual spirituality and this sort of mental, emotional, spiritual side of it is part of functional medicine, right? It's, it's all one and the same, you know, another word for functional medicine is integrative medicine, right? So it's sort of integrating all of these aspects of health and wellness. It's, it's, it's the spiritual side of it. And that's why we are cultivating mindfulness practices and meditation practices, or for some people it's prayer, if that's, you know, on that, if they're on that level, or for some people just going out in nature and using that as a meditation, because those things influence inflammation levels. They in, influence somebody's healing. They influence many things. So that, I think that's why functional medicine, it really comes down to that because it's integrating all of the, the sort of science and art of, of all of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So can you explain the difference in your mind between functional medicine and biohacking? Cause we did meet at a biohacking conference. <laughs> so I'm curious to hear what you, you consider to be the differences. Well, I mean, functional medicine is, is a field of healthcare. Um, biohacking can be a part of functional medicine, but it, it's, um, you know, functional medicine, let me define that. It's, uh, I think it's better contrasted with conventional medicine and, you know, biohacking fits in within that, right? It's, it fits within what we do in functional medicine. There's a lot of overlap a component of it because it's really living your best life, optimizing your health, finding out ways to take your health to the next level, basically. And that's really, it has it in common with, with functional medicine, biohacking does. The, the first thing we do differently in functional medicine is we look, we're looking at labs using a thinner reference range of optimal. And I think that's definitely a commonality between um, biohacking and functional medicine is optimal, not average, because the lab's reference range that you'll get on your standard conventional labs is largely a statistical bell curve average of people who go to labs. People that predominantly go to labs are people that are sadly going through health problems. So there's a lot of people that go to their doctor and they want to find out why they're going through their health issue, you know, whether that's fatigue or weight loss resistance or some inflammation issue, some neurological problem, whatever the case may be, hormonal issue. And they'll go to the doctor and the doctor says, oh, the labs are fine. You know, you're just depressed. Here's an antidepressant or you're just getting older or you're just stressed out. You're just a new mom. They sort of, you know, explain away how this person could be having these symptoms despite it, these quote unquote normal labs, or they'll say they're crazy. They'll allude to the fact that they're, the person's a hypochondriac or they're exaggerating or they must be doing something wrong uh, that they're not telling them. Um, what they're unintentionally telling that patient is you're a lot like the other people with health problems that we're comparing you to. And comparing yourself to people with health problems is no way for you to find out how you can feel your best. So that's definitely something that biohacking and functional medicine have in common when it comes to labs. And I think that's why there's so many people within the biohacking community that are my patients, because they really want that guidance. They really want to get to the root cause and they really want to look at optimal, not average. Mm -hmm. And then we realize that you can't just look at the superficial labs either. And that's another thing that we do in functional medicine. We're looking at the root components as to why people have issues. So things like underlying gut problems or chronic infections or nutrient deficiencies or hormonal imbalances. And from a diagnostic standpoint, to get objective data and really be data driven to see those numbers improve as we're, we're integrating protocols in somebody's life. And then another aspect of functional medicine is bioindividuality, right? It's, it's we're all different and there's not this cookie cutter, one size fits all approach to getting well. So we're using food as medicine, we're using natural medicine, we're using medications when needed, we're using their other therapeutic tools, other biohacking uh, tools, other more advanced protocols when needed to really get that person's labs and therefore their life uh, optimized. So that's really what functional medicine is, of which it resonates quite a bit with, with the biohacking world. Mm. So what are some of the biohacking style protocols that uh, you... Um 
prescribe to your patients that you use yourself in, in your daily life in terms of your health maintenance? Well, I mean, it could be anything from, I'll just tell you my patient base to give you some context. We're dealing a lot with people with autoimmune issues or they're somewhere on that autoimmune inflammation spectrum. They not, may not be diagnosed with an autoimmune condition, but maybe they just want to prevent themselves or mitigate risk factors, do everything they can to uh, decrease risk factors to becoming that, uh, or they're struggling with fatigue. Um, those are my main patient base. So for those people, some common biohacking things, or what I would consider biohacking things, are things like a cryotherapy, something that we integrate from an attenuation of different inflammatory problems, sauna therapy, definitely a major part of that, breath work, meditation, which, you know, these are age old things that we call biohacking now, yeah. but really show uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, they're popular amongst the biohacking world, but these are very old things. Um, and um, what else? Peptide therapy. We use that. Uh, we can get a little bit out there with some patients that are struggling with very resistant autoimmune problems. I've, you know, we're discussing with patients about how menthic therapy, which is a little bit out there, but they're basically, good worms. Uh, and there's some compelling research out there still developing, but we explore these more out of the box things too, when needed. Certainly not everybody needs that, but these like hel helmets uh, are a way to sort of reset the microbiome, uh, the people that are struggling with di uh, different autoimmune problems. So that's used sometimes. Um, and then of course, the more mainstream like food, herbs, my, my, um, natural medicines, fasting protocols. These are the type of things that I'm clinically monitoring and coaching and really tailoring based on the individual because not everybody has to do all of those things. So it's really like what, and that's part, maybe the back to the science and art of wellness. There's many people in the biohacking community that they end up becoming sort of hyper-focused and kind of obsessive about all the things where all the things aren't necessarily needed. Like what are the needle movers for you? What is your art of of wellness. And that's always what I'm trying to suss out for them based on the data, based off of data and also clinically monitoring them and guiding them and getting rid of things when they're superfluous, where they're sort of obsolete. Like maybe we needed them for a time, but you don't have to keep doing them and editing down basically what are the most impactful tools within their toolbox of feeling great. So, you know, biohacking is part of that, but it, it Sometimes it needs some good old editing from the likes of me to kind of have it be sustainable for them because they end up doing all this stuff and wasting their time on things that aren't necessarily needed. Right. Or taking 10 times the number of supplements that they really need. Yeah. I, t I yeah, take more supplements 100%. than I need for sure. <laughs> I just don't know which ones yeah. to take. And it's a, exactly. And that's normally what I hear from patients. So I'll, I'll see the big list. Uh, and then I'll say, hey, do you notice any needle movers or is it hard to tell? And it's like hard to tell because there's this massive supplement graveyard and you're sort of taking it all together and you know, and it, it all makes sense. Like most of it always is well-intentioned, makes sense. It thought, it's thoughtful. It's good quality. It's like high quality stuff. And that's most of our patients are extremely erudite when it comes to this stuff. But it's not that it's bad. It's just not necessarily needed. And we can sort of boil it down to like, what are the most impactful things? Yeah. Which doesn't, you know, we don't always know that right out of the gate, but as we're clinically monitoring and coaching and looking at labs and adjusting things appropriately, we could start to really pare it down. Yeah. What do you think of muscle testing as a way to get a sense for whether a supplement or, or vitamin or whatever is beneficial or superfluous? It's not really part of functional medicine, um, but you know, I'd say anecdotally, I have patients that tell me from other practitioners, they found that to be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I know some people swear by it. So I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't want to delegitimize it, but it's definitely not something that we do mm -hmm. in functional medicine. I'm, I'm reading the book or listening to the book, Power Versus Force. Uh, are you familiar with that one? Uh, That's a good book. I've heard of it. Yeah. I haven't read it. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's real science to muscle testing. It really is. And, uh, uh, applied kinesiology is what they call it, I guess, in the, mm -hmm. in okay. the science yeah. world. And yeah, it's an, it's an impressive, uh, piece of work, that book. So you might check it out. Yeah. Uh, so what about things like, um, fecal transplants and, and mm -hmm. like more, uh, kind of extreme 
therapies for uh, folks who have, uh, let's say, irritable bowel syndrome or something that's mm -hmm. Crohn's, really debilitating. What kind of breakthroughs can you get for your your uh, your patients, your clients, uh, through alternative therapies or or more yeah. kind of uh, cutting edge stuff? <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think it's promising. I think there are certain cases where that's appropriate or maybe should be explored and you should talk with your doctor about it. It's only really approved in the United States with uh, cases of C. diff. But I think that is a pointer to a lot of different types of cases of people that have acute inflammatory problems of the gastrointestinal system of how that how a fecal transplant or series of fecal transplants could be beneficial in supporting the healthy modulation of someone's gut microbiome. So yeah, it's one of the tools within the toolbox when it's needed. Um, and sometimes we're facilitating with other clinics in different countries to you know have it done appropriately. I don't think that people need to be going and blending up their poop in a blender and doing it on their own. But <laughs> if they're, if they're, not, if they're clinically monitored, <laughs> not recommended. Yeah. So talk to you with your doctor, definitely. And, and let me say the negative side of something like that is I've seen horrible flare ups from cases like that mm -hmm. uh, fecal transplants as well, because they're doing it with the best of intentions, but they're really modulating the microbiome. And we don't really know the full complexity of somebody's microbiome. And you're getting things that may have been fine in this one person, but you're getting this sort of massive dose of it through a fecal transplant. And it's, I see people have very flare, big flare ups of symptoms. Now they will calm down and we'll, we'll get it under control, but it's definitely doesn't, there are potential unwanted side effects from me messing with your microbiome for lack of better words, so adjusting your microbiome in such a significant way. Right. And it's not just about the uh, the bugs that are growing in your gut. It's also about your genetics and how easy or hard it is for toxins and baddies to get into your system. I just found out yesterday, for example, going over in an interview with Dr. Kashif Khan, he's uh, CEO of the DNA company. We went through my results from the DNA test uh, that I took a few months ago. And he's like, well, uh, the bad news is you have uh, a gut that is uh, it gets infiltrated by toxins and, and, and so forth very easily. You have a uh, low defense against that. Your, your immune ab ability mm -hmm. to keep that out is, is really low uh, genetically. Yeah. So that plays into whether you would ever consider doing, let's say, a fecal transplant or, or, or something that uh, you're comparing someone to you and not realizing like their genetics are completely different than yours. So yeah, the interplay between um, epigenetics and genetics, and you're absolutely right. So time will tell, I think, for these practices, I think that they should be explored. I think they should be researched. I think people need to be asking these questions. But I don't think it's as simple as, you know, take this, your problem's all solved. Like it may be a tool within the toolbox and be worth exploring for some people that have exhausted all other options. But it's definitely not, you know, I, I, it, it's not uh, stop eating McDonald's, uh, swallow some worms and have a poop transplant. And the next day it's like, let's try to look at many other more uh, concrete, reliable um, tools within the toolbox. Uh, but for some people down the road, it may be something that they can talk with a doctor about. Yeah. Definitely stop the McDonald's though. <laughs> yeah. Start there. <laughs> yeah. Start there. So if you haven't, how, how do you diagnose somebody coming in, uh, to your practice with, let's say chronic fatigue? They have no idea when it started, how it started, what, uh, sorts of potential factors come into play. They just are exhausted all the time and uh, they can't remember a time where they weren't. So how do you come to, to find what, what's the root cause of it? It starts with the health history, right? It's really, which is not a very sexy part of it all, but it's such, it's so foundational. I think it's not given in the respect and the art that it deserves because a very solid health history, which is involves just 
back to that earlier statement of like holding space for somebody and listening, but also asking the right questions and and really following up with secondary and tertiary questions that are needed to pry sometimes to really delve into the places for, in that person's life and health history, what they're going through, delve in places that maybe have never been looked at from a conventional medicine standpoint. And oftentimes even the alternative world. I mean, most of my patients have exhausted conventional medicine for the most part, and they have seen a lot of great people within the alternative health world too. And it's not like most of them are better off than they would be if they weren't doing all the things that they're doing, like I mentioned, but they're not where they need to be. So a health history really illuminates things that haven't been looked at and giving it a fresh perspective and a thoughtful insight into, I think, that the, what these people need. So chronic fatigue syndrome is no exception to that, right? And they, people like people that are struggling with autoimmunity, chronic fatigue syndrome, or what we call a mystery illnesses is what typically what medicine will label it as. They really deserve that time. So I'm spending a good hour at least on the initial consultation. I'm really talking to them via webcam um, and looking at any past labs they've done. I'm looking at all the things that they're doing currently or have gone through and starting back from birth on and really going through what is their, what's their story um, and really what needs to be looked at and what maybe needs to be updated that have been look, has been looked at. Um, Cause I, oftentimes I see patients doing good things, but they're not dosing appropriately. They're not giving it the time that it needs. They're not filling in the gaps with things that are missing. So it all fits perfectly, sort of like a, uh, a perfect storm of great things. So I, uh, it's, it's not just always new perspective. Sometimes it's looking at the things that are good, but just aren't being done appropriately or in the right amount and get more given the time that it needs. So chronic fatigue syndrome specifically, after the health history, then we see what's needed, right? What sort of protocols are needed? What sort of labs, if any, are needed to either update data or to look at things that haven't been looked at? And it's normally a bit of both. But chronic fatigue syndrome, specifically, since you mentioned that, it's like just like so many other diagnoses. It's just a description of how the person's feeling, right? I mean, chronic fatigue syndrome. Anybody that has CFS will already tell you, yeah, I already know I've been tired for a long time. <laughs> it's not like really telling them why they have the problem in the first place. It's just our nice way in mainstream medicine, in, in modern medicine, to say, let's put you in a box. Let's give you a diagnosis code, an ICD-10, and let's label you with that. And that's similar to like things like fibromyalgia. Well, think about that. It's just telling you how the person's feeling or people that have irritable bowel syndrome. Okay, it's just that. Or even autoimmunity as a whole, it's, it's the immune system attacking itself. It doesn't explain why. It's just describing the general symptoms and mechanisms. So we want to find out why we have the problem in the first place in functional medicine. So if someone for chronic fatigue syndrome, for one person, it could be A, B, and C reasons. For the next person, it's D and F. It's just... We see things like chronic fatigue syndrome, you know, fatigue or digestive problems or neurological symptoms or whatever we're talking about. We see those as just check engine lights. So the check engine lights on on the car. OK, we know there's a problem. We know there's something dysregulated. We know that something's not optimal here, but we don't really know why. So it's just it's not easy to it's 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 very easy to say, well, just take this and everybody with chronic fatigue syndrome gets this. So it's like their chronic fatigue protocol or it's just that, that thing. The reality is there's, again, the science and art of this. And just like when you take your car to the mechanic, he doesn't just cover up the check engine light and say, see you in six months. If he does, get a new mechanic. But the reality is that what's underneath the hood, what's misfiring, what's dysfunctional, what's imbalanced, what's not where it should be that needs to give it needs the attention it deserves. So that's the health history really informs what diagnostics are needed. And that's exactly what the mechanic does. He right, he hooks the car up to diagnostics. It's exactly what we're doing in functional medicine. We're just look, running the most relevant labs. So you don't want to run every lab under the sun. There's a lot of great labs out there. You don't necessarily need all of them. So that's back to the editing and sort of what is the what are the stones, so to speak, that have are most likely to have something underneath it, which is now, why we're only running clinically appropriate labs it, from, you know, from our perspective. You know, conventional medicine can critique <laughs> functional medicine and say we're running too many labs. Well, not if the, you're taking a proper health history. Not if I'm only running labs that are going to determine what action steps we take. 
or at least get a baseline to compare and contrast that when we retest to make sure we're, what we're doing is working beyond the person's quality of life improving. I want to see the data uh, improving and adjusting the protocol ap- appropriately. Um, mm. So that's sort of, but like it's in any number of things. Is it a nutrient deficiency? Is it a chronic infection? Is it underlying gut problems? Is it a hormonal imbalance? Is it some sort of past trauma? Is it a combination? Typically it is of all of these problems. That's what needs to be looked at, not only for chronic fatigue syndrome, but all chronic health problems and, and which the commonality of to many of these things are is inflammation, chronic inflammation. So what's driving the inflammation? That's really the question here. Um, and that is different from person to person. Right, right. I've I've heard so many horror stories of people spending a decade trying to figure out what it is and it's toxic mold exposure like Dave Asprey. It took him a very long time to figure out all the brain fog and everything was from uh, from mold, black mold. Uh, someone else I know uh, had uh, gotten Lyme disease and it took a decade for her to uh, find out that that was what it was. And um, Mm -hmm. I'm reading the book Medical Medium by Anthony William. And uh, in in the book, he's uh, talking about Epstein-Barr virus being something that causes a whole cascade of events uh, down the line that end end up being uh, turning into uh, symptoms like chronic fatigue and so forth. So um, how do you go about finding something that has been elusive for a decade like that. Well, it's interesting. I mean, these things are oftentimes called great mimickers, right? Or great imitators, because a lot of things can mimic things like fatigue or inflammation or neurological symptoms, etc. So it's important not to hang your hat on one thing and say, well, that's just a problem for everybody. And that's sort of the I say this in complete love, but I'm saying, and sometimes it's hard to bring nuance and context into a book, but like medical medium boils everything down to Epstein-Barr virus. I think that's a very reductive way of looking at it. And we have like Anthony, Alejandro Younger is one of my best friends and he wrote the forward to Met, is Anthony Williams book. So we have, I, I, I think he's doing a lot of good things. He's getting people on healthier whole foods. I think that's a good thing. But ultimately, if I hung my hat on, this is the cause for everybody all day long, I'd be proven wrong a lot. And Epstein-Barr virus specifically, it's about, statistically, it's about a 95% of U.S. adults have had exposure to Epstein-Barr virus. And to his point, and I would 100% agree with him on this point, diagnostics aren't great when you're looking at chronic viral infections. So it's important not to be too flippant with your words and say, well, Epstein-Barr virus is nothing, but I don't think it's everything either. So I'm pretty middle of the road, context matters, and labs aren't everything because there's no perfect labs out there. And they're snapshots in time for these great mimickers and great imitators, and they can hide very well on labs. So taking that sort of middle ground objective approach, I, I see reactivated viral infections quite a bit. Um, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, human rb 6 virus, they are a problem and should be addressed appropriately when they are a problem. But for some people, it's not Epstein-Barr virus. Or I would say this, Epstein-Barr virus is reactivated and perpetually reactivated because of something like mold toxins or mycotoxins. So then you have to look at the environment of which that virus can even reactivate. And sometimes people chase things like viral infection. Oftentimes, because of medical mediums books, they think that's their thing. If I just, if I just dealt with my thing, all my problems will go away. The reality is it's rarely just one thing. We have to look at what's called the bioterrain or like the context of the system at large. And we have to look at all the confluence of factors, this perfect storm of variables that are at play, of which Epstein-Barr virus could be a part of that. But I, these things don't happen in a vacuum either. The body is brilliantly interconnected. And oftentimes Epstein-Barr virus will be perpetually reactivated, meaning you'll see early antigens being positive against Epstein-Barr virus on labs. And the lab, even the conventional lab, will label it as a reactivation of this virus. Okay, why? And then we have to look at all the other variables that are contributing to this perfect storm of what's keeping the body in this sort of sympathetic, fight or flight, stressed, inflamed state. So there's physiological stressors like mold toxins that we have to look at, or you mentioned Lyme and its co-infections, Babesia and Bartonella. We have to look at that. So to answer your question more pointedly, it's labs and health history and clinical experience to be able to give this person the attention that they deserve and adjust the protocol accordingly. That's really the answer. 
um, because we have data. We have some of the best labs out there now, whereas a decade or so ago, we didn't have that. And another 10 years, we'll have even better labs. I'm, I, I'm, and I, I, every year, I'm, I, I, it, I'm hopeful that we'll get objective data for these people that have, have been struggling for a long time. And it's extremely important for me to give them answers. But the labs are only the part of it, though, right? It's, 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 we don't want to just get a pile of labs and just look at our problems. Then it's like, what are we going to do about it? And it's really giving the attention, giving attention to things that need the, the time that it needs and the attention it needs. So these are all, I mean, you look at Lyme, like Borrelia burgdorferi or Babesia bartonelli's co-infections or Epstein-Barr virus or another herpes virus, or people that have mold toxins like Aspergillus, Dacobotrys, the okra toxins that are released from these and different toxins that are released from these toxic mold. What are the commonality? They're biotoxins. They're just toxins that are released from bacteria, viruses, and mold. And we want to address all of them appropriately. And then that, that's back to that bigger thing of bioterrain. Do we always have to know exactly the right, the exact bug that's going on? Not necessarily. Squabbling over that, it, debating over that isn't very helpful in most cases. Sometimes it's, it does adjust protocols, of pro, it's like certain agents, certain antimicrobials, or certain antivirals, certain antifungals will work better for based on lab data. But oftentimes there's some core things that we need to be supporting, like binders and biofilm disruptors and detox support and antimicrobials and improving overall the bioterrain and dealing with any past stress and trauma that's contributing to that person being stuck in that sort of autonomic, sympathetic response. So these are the things that I'm always juggling, like what needs attention and what what's, what doesn't need attention and, mm -hmm. and giving it the time it needs. Well, what's an example of a lab that is newer or more advanced now from 10 years ago, or it just wouldn't maybe even have existed? So the last 10 years, because I've been doing this for the past 12-ish years. So I would say the best labs, don't well, not say the best, some of the really good labs that probably weren't all available um, at least in their current form, I should say, they've, they've evolved, even if the lab themselves were around that time, like their technology has improved. But I think Cyrex is doing some really brilliant things and have for the past eight, nine plus years, at least. I don't know the exact date, but I've been using them for quite a bit of time. But their technology, their arrays, their data uh, biomarkers are expanding every few years. Uh, Arista Vijdani is one of the leading immunologists in this space, and we've used them for a long time to look at this realm of autoimmunity and the realm of inflammation, the realm of pathogens like viruses, mold, and bacteria. Um, I, I, I think Cyrex really is, is helpful for us as a clinic to provide information and to compare and contrast that as we're integrating protocols in somebody's life. I think that Igenix and Armin are doing really smart things within the Lyme literate world. Um, I think that as far as hormonal testing, uh, I think what the D Dutch uh, tests are, are really smart data, more accurate data than the more classic, like old school uh, circadian rhythm testing. But like looking at cortisol awakening response and looking at the context of the hormones, really smart that we didn't have 10, 11 years ago. Um, and then I don't want to underestimate like just conventional labs too. Like I think that... Um, we can get a lot of information through Quest and LabCorp. Uh, and I use them probably more than anything for the foundational stuff. It's just the interpretation of those labs that I would do differently, right? I, I still would look at the conventional reference ranges. They're there and we, we want to acknowledge them. But I want to look at optimal, not average, and not just compare you to people who go to labs. But I want to look at where does vibrant wellness reside? Where does the body function the best and get you there? So... I put all that data on spreadsheets and color code it for people so they can look at optimal, not average. Where, does the, where, where is the functional range there? So those are some things that come to mind. Um, I think, yeah, I, I, oh, let's mention this, the, the mold toxin test, the, the urine mycotoxin test is extremely helpful to measure the most common mold toxins. My hope is in another 10 years or so or less, that we get data on more mold toxins and more uh, more biomarkers within the mold toxin space because there are a lot more mold toxins than we can quantify on labs. We have some good solid data and we test the most common ones. So I would say it helps most people. 
but I know there are certain examples that I can, that come to mind over the years of consulting people is that you can assume there are other mold toxins that were not being showing up on the test in part because they didn't have the biomarker for it. Um, and or some of those people just are not detoxing it out of their urine and we can catch it on blood, which is an interesting phenomenon is that you can catch it on like a blood immune response test to the mold, the meaning the body is responding very viscerally against the mold and it's causing an inflammatory cascade, but it's not coming out in the urine. So you never want to hang your hat on one lab and say like, this is my thing. Always want to come down to context matters, health history matters and, um, yeah, it's just an important part of my job. Yeah, that's awesome. And then uh, there's the GI map test where it, uh, you send in a fecal sample, and then I think they can check for mold exposure uh, through that as well, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah there are some great tests that you can get. And I like GI maps a lot. And I think that's another field that's definitely evolved over the past decade plus is the improvement of the, the specificity and the sensitivity of microbiome testing. And I, that's another one where I know in another 10 years, we'll have even better data, but yes, running the best data we have to date and gut health tests can be very uh, telling, mm -hmm. uh, not just gut health specific or gut centric, but the, sort of the larger immunological or other pathogenic. Uh, issues that may be at, at play. Right, right. So like your uh, mucosal uh, immune response can yeah. be picked secretory up. Secretory IgA, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, secretory and, IgA and running zonulin antibodies, which are the proteins that govern gut lining permeability. You can measure different, you know, food reactions to via this as well. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Now, something that I, 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 10 years ago would have been more unusual or more kind of cutting edge would be to check the uh, particle size of the LDL. And uh, isn't that more of a common thing now? Because it's really about mm -hmm. how the size and the density of these particles. If they're really small, they can wedge into the epithelial layer and do a lot of damage, especially if your genetics are that you have kind of paper thin uh, arterial walls and, and not the, the really uh, resilient ones. Absolutely. Yeah. I've been looking at uh, NMR tests, nuclear magnetic resonance tests, these sort of quests called the cardio IQ lab corp, you know, it has another name for it, but NMR level profile, basically just looking at the sub fractionation of the particles that carry cholesterol and the context of these particles. Absolutely. It's something that we talked about in functional medicine for a long time and we always looked at it, but it was definitely poo pooed if you will conventional medicine because they were just looking at that total cholesterol and if it was above 200 they would have put you on statin drugs and many conventional doctors still do that but it's becoming less like again context matters like what we cannot just understand cholesterol metabolism off of like just the serum cholesterol that's a very incomplete perspective on cholesterol quality um so yeah it's it's changing and i think people are becoming more and more aware of not just advanced cardio profiles, but um, more comprehensive testing at large and, and wanting access to this stuff. And these are all conventional tests. Like you don't need a third party out of the box lab to get this amazing data. I mean, Quest and LabCorp, the two biggest labs in the United States provide this data. It's just, you need the doctor to run it, which we do and for them. And then you need the interpretation of it. And then you need action steps to do something about it. And I think that's sort of the bigger, I kind of understand the conventional model of care in that way where it's like, okay, it is superfluous for them because the end result, all they need is that total cholesterol to give you that statin drug or something like it. So they're running the appropriate tests to give you the appropriate medication. So if you run the NMR test, they're going to say, okay, well, that's good information, but we're still going to give you that tool within the toolbox, which is just that statin medication. That can be applied to many other different sections within labs. It's like, okay, well, within their system, they're trained to diagnose a disease and match it with a medication. So they're running the basic labs they need to get it covered by insurance and, and then give you the appropriate medication. So... I understand well, when, why this... when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like yes, a nail, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's a lot of hammers and nails going on, but the reality is, you know, 
in, in functional medicine, it does influence what we do and what we give attention to and, yeah. and, com and compare it over time. What are your thoughts about celery juice? That's something that uh, Anthony William touts uh, a lot. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm, I've, I've uh, witnessed my wife taking celery juice on a, on a daily basis and feeling a lot better. So there's something to it. I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on it. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think green juices in general, like I've always drank green juices. I think they're good. Celery is typically the base of celery, uh, of green juices because it is so water filled, right? It's so, um, it's easy to get a lot of juice from it. Um, well, there's this, there's the salts in it that that's yeah. the, the, the secret sauce or the, the magic yeah. according to Anthony William is, uh, this, this particular salts that are in celery that are not in anything else. And so it's celery juice and <laughs> not yeah, just I know juice, that. but I know celery that. juice. Yeah. yeah. I know that's his thing. It's his thing. Yeah. So I think it is a tool within the toolbox. So I have patients have juices with celery in it too. I've seen celery juice specifically really help people's digestion. They should be judicious with it. Cause I see many people with SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, too much of this stuff can really flare them up. So I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's actually good, but the dose matters, how much they're drinking matters, like what the labs matter. So I don't think it's like a magic cure-all for everyone's problem, but I do think that bringing healthy foods, whole foods, nutrient-dense foods in one's life is a good idea. And this is a tool within the toolbox with, under that umbrella of whole foods that can be beneficial. Uh, especially yeah. for people that have stressed out digestive sim systems, taking the fiber out of the vegetable, celery, and just having the juice with the salts and the you know different electrolytes in it and minerals in it and phyto compounds in it, it can be beneficial certainly. So I think in the in the context of a whole foods diet, as having that as being a part of the tool within the toolbox, certainly. I've seen for people that have chronic constipation, celery juice be very helpful. People that are struggling with di different digestive problems that aren't IBSD or looser stools, I find that celery juice can be very, let's just say, cleansing <laughs> to the system. And you're getting nutrient density and you're getting vit vitamins and minerals and salts into your diet, which is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And uh, I'm, I'm curious, do you do, you do uh, grounding? Uh, where you're uh, connected to the to the ground, you get your feet uh, bare feet on 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 grass outside, or you're using a grounding mat or anything like that. Oh yeah, I, I it's cold here right now in Western Pennsylvania, but I uh, get out as much as I can. It's been actually pretty nice lately, and I walk outside and take my shoes off whenever I can. Absolutely, it's a very major therapeutic tool in my life personally, and things that I integrate in patients' lives. And um, I also have a few PEMF mats, which kind of mimic that in, in some ways. Uh, so, yeah, I, I like I definitely like the science around that. Cool. And how about red light therapy and or like infrared saunas? Oh, yeah, that too. Yeah. Uh, certainly. Uh, personally, yes. And then also for patients, it's, it's, it's integrated in many other protocols because um, you know, we're dealing with people that have methylation impairments and detoxification impairments and, you know, ATP production problems, mitochondrial problems. So, yeah, it's a it's a part in many people's protocols. Mm -hmm. Is one of the the tests that you do typically a, a, a DNA kind of genetics test like the DNA company or uh, something similar? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're looking at raw gene, gene data. And looking at the more clinically relevant SNPs or, you know, single nucleotide polymorphisms and looking at methylation, detoxification, uh, APO, APOE gene variants. Um, yeah, so those are, um, those are common gene variants that we look at. We also I look at HLA gene variants as well, which sort of regulates the immune system's inflammatory response, how it recognizes the uh, foreign tissue and, and its own. Um, because a mechanism for many people's, you know, inflammation is a specific subtype of inflammation of auto, autoimmunity when the immune system loses recognition of self, as all the research puts it. So it's sort of the, this um, molecular mimicry or the case of mistaken identity. So these people typically have a higher percentage of different HLA gene variants and methylation gene variants. So yeah, we're looking at all that. So it's sort of the 
it, like the, the typical, depending on the study that you look at, it's about a third of the puzzle is genetic. So we want to look at a third to understand what that person's own sort of framework is, but it's only a third, you know, there are two thirds as is epigenetic. So it's a lifestyle things that we at least have some agency over uh, some influence over how our, inf our genetics are being expressed and how our physiology is being expressed. So it's, it's definitely a piece of the puzzle genetics and something that I look at when it's needed yep. and it's needed for everybody basically to give them at least a perspective on once we get the body healthier, what are the things that are never going to change? Like these genetics are never going to change, but what can we do to support those appropriately? So if the person has a mm -hmm. double MTH far gene variant, they're probably going to need a little bit more methylation support, even when we get everything healthier. Um, and the HLA gene variant, like what, what's going on there? How maybe you are more sensitive to Lyme bacteria or viruses or mold toxins, or even when we get everything perfect, you're going to want to be making your life a cleanse in some ways, or, um, you want to mitigate this from happening in the future. Yeah, those are great stuff. Uh, one, uh, well, two more really quick questions. Uh, binders, right? So you take bind with cytodetox or you, like, what are these, uh, uh, what's, what's the benefit of taking binders? I, I have a, a sense of it, but I'd love our, our listener to understand the importance of it. Yeah. I think there's not one binder that works for everybody. So I typically do some sort of cycling or rotation of binders because different things will bind certain pathogens better than others. Um, so that's why labs can be helpful in that way. Um, but a rotational cyclical approach with things like binders and antimicrobials for that matter and biofilm disruptors can be more of a synergistic approach where if one is better for one thing, then the other would be better for the other. So, um, yeah, a blend of things like zeolite, uh, diatomaceous earth, activated charcoal, bentonite clay are some agents that we use to support um, binding. Gotcha. Cool. All right. Last question. How, how do you price and, uh, your, your services? How do, how do we, uh, how do we hire you and work with you? Cause, uh, clearly you're <laughs> at top of the line. I mean, I'm, Thank you. uh, I'm, I want to sign up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate the opportunity to, to share my, my heart on this. Um, everything's at drwillcole.com. I mean, we have different options. It's sort of an ascension, like different ways that I could be there for you. Um, so yeah, everything's at drwillcole.com. Just go to the consultation page there. There's all the information there. Um, and people work with me in different capacities. Some people just get labs and I'm going over their labs. Some people are going visit by visit. Some people are in sort of a concierge model where there's weekly group calls with me. So it depends on what they want. Not everybody's looking for the same thing. Um, and that consultation also will help me figure that out too. It's like, okay, not only what's clinically relevant, but What's actually, I, how can I be there for you in the way that you're even looking for and understanding that? So I'll make those options for you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Will. This was Thanks. fabulous. Likewise. The website again, drwillcole.com. And uh, you're, you're uh, most active on which social platform? Instagram. Instagram. But Instagram. I'm on Facebook, TikTok, all the things there too, Twitter. But Instagram is okay. where I'm living the most in the social world. <laughs> Got it. Dr. Will Cole is your Instagram uh, username there. And uh, yep. Cool. So thank, thank you, you so much, Will. And uh, listener, get out there and do something with this information. It's not just edutainment. <laughs> you got to like change that. your behaviors and it starts with something small. And uh, to have somebody like Will helping you, coaching you through uh, these lifestyle changes so that you can live a much longer and healthier life is really important. So we'll catch you in the next episode. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off.